Today and in the next few lectures, we are going to study a very important class of uh, continuous Markov processes called diffusion processes. And there is a very large uh, body of literature on these processes and a very large number of applications both in physics and in other subjects, chemical physics for instance, uh, chemistry and so on and so forth. But what we are going to focus on is not so much the detailed technical mathematical rigorously mathematical aspects of the subject as the, the possible applications to various physical situations. Uh, let me begin by recalling to you that we had just started defining continuous Markov processes and in particular I, I said we will talk about stationary continuous Markov processes. We can relax this assumption of stationarity a little bit and talk about stationary or non-stationary processes and as you will see as we go along the most important uh, non-stationary random process is in fact the diffusion of a particle that itself its position is a non-stationary process. The velocity turns out to be stationary but the position is non-stationary as you will see when we go along. So to start with uh, recall that we said that these processes are described by a conditional density which satisfies an equation of this kind in the stationary case. Okay. X is the random variable and a set of values taken by the random variable and the probability density function the conditional density function conditioned on this initial value satisfies an equation of the form uh, an integral over all possible x primes. Uh, dx primes and then inside you have a w of x x prime p of x prime t at x naught minus the loss term which is w of x prime x p of x t x naught. This is the continuum analog of the discrete equation that we wrote down in the case of a process which took on a discrete set of values or attained a discrete set of states. Okay. Now as in the other case this is an integral differential equation although it is linear in this P and therefore is not a very trivial equation to solve. Certainly if it had been a matrix equation we could have written the solution as the exponential of a matrix multiplied by T and then try to look for methods of exponentiating this matrix but here that is not true this is some kernel. So it is an integral differential equation this is some kernel function of x and x prime ditto here and it is not at all so obvious what the solution is here. One approach would be to try to convert this to a differential equation but because it is an integral equation and you are integrating over all values of this here and no conditions have been put on these transition probabilities at all these transition rates. Uh, it is immediately sort of intuitively clear that the order of the differential equation in the x variable will tend to become infinite in this case and in fact that is so and I will write that down without going through the intermediate steps except to indicate how to do it. What you have to do is to treat this as a function of x prime and you put x for instance is x minus x prime you put it equal to some delta x or something like that does not have to be small and then you do a Taylor expansion in terms of this delta x and whenever you get derivative operators you try to put it on the p by integration by parts and the result is that this becomes equal to also equal to and I am going to skip these steps a summation from n equal to 1 to infinity minus 1 to the n over n factorial delta n over delta x n a n of x p of x t for given x naught of course. So it becomes equal to that formally these two are equal to each other where these coefficients a n of x equal to an integral of moments of this guy x plus delta x starting with x for example and then delta x to the power n and d delta x this difference and the nth moment of this increment with this as the weight factor is the definition of a n of x here. Okay. 
and delta x is over the range allowed range here. So, it is a definite integral this thing is a definite integral and it is a function of where you start namely x. So, this is the exact formal equivalence. Now, of course, it immediately raises the question of when is this valid, when is it convergent and so on and so forth. I am not going to talk about those technical issues at the moment except to say that you can make specific conditions, put specific conditions under which this equation reduces to this infinite order partial differential equation and this is called the Kramers Moyal expansion. does not serve much purpose except for formal purposes because it is an infinite order differential equation. So, it is not any, uh, any easier to solve than this, but it gives you a little bit of uh, physical insight as to what are the terms that are contributing out here and how do you interpret them and so on and so forth. Okay. But there is one great simplification that occurs for a specific class of processes called diffusion processes. And by this I do not mean, uh, I mean diffusion in a technical sense which is not restricted to the physical diffusion of a particle in space or anything like that, but a mathematical term which says there is a class of processes called diffusion processes. For which this equation simplifies enormously okay. and there is a theorem a rigorous theorem which says remarkably enough if these moments of this uh, increment delta x the amount by which x jumps to a new value if these moments vanish for any n greater than equal to 3 if it so happens that a n is identically 0 for any n greater than equal to 3 then a n is equal to 0 for all n greater than equal to 3 ok. It is called Pavula's theorem and it is a remarkable theorem. It is not magic, it is possible to derive it fairly straightforwardly, but the statement is if a n equal to 0 for some n greater than equal to 3, for all And of course, that immediately simplifies matters enormously and processes for which this happens are called diffusion processes okay. because that would immediately imply so that this equation becomes the following delta p over delta let us leave out all the arguments of this p equal to minus delta over delta x a 1 of x p plus 1 half delta 2 over delta x 2 a 2 of x because the higher moments are 0 out here. and this uh, 2 factorial I have put in here as a half there. This is called the Fokker Planck equation. They originally derived it in a different context altogether, in a related context, but in a physical context of a particle diffusing in space and this is was for the velocity of this particle, but it today we call it the Fokker Planck equation in general for any diffusion process and I will use the same terminology. And you can go ahead and interpret what this means and it will turn out we will see the specific examples that this term represents the effect of noise on this variable x that is what causes x to fluctuate randomly whereas this term very often describes the effect of deterministic evolution in this x as we will see from the examples. 
So, this part is the what x would do its distribution would do in the absence of any noise and this is what makes it random. So, very often this is called the drift term and that is called the diffusion term and we will use we will use these terms in general even though they come from the physical application I am going to talk about. Okay. So, this is if you like this is the drift and this portion is the diffusion. It is still not a trivial equation as you can see because it has got this term here, it is a second order in the position variable. I will frequently call this a spatial variables because for want of a better term although it need not be that at all. In fact, in uh, the original context of the Fokker-Planck equation it was a velocity variable. Hmm? It is first order in time but second order in the other variable. So, this is technically not as simple an equation as say Laplace's equation or Poisson's equation because of this inhomogeneity. Hmm? You will recognize special cases of it. For example, if this A1 had not been present and if that A2 were a constant, this looks like the diffusion equation, the ordinary diffusion equation for particles move diffusing on a line where which would be delta P over delta T is D times D2 P over DX2. We will see how that comes about. Now, of course, one could ask uh, what happens, can I solve this equation in general and so on? The answer is no, in general for arbitrary coefficients A1 and A2, it is not so trivial to solve at all. Can I incorporate non-stationary process in this? Yes, indeed, that has nothing to do with the vanishing of the moments or anything like that. It is an independent statement. If these were time dependent explicitly, then of course you have a non-stationary Markov process and then you have to be careful, you have to write x naught comma t naught etc. keep track of that and then this would become time dependent here and it would be time dependent here because w would be time dependent explicitly. So, it is possible to incorporate non-stationarity into this uh, business by looking at time dependent <coughs> coefficients. We are not going to do that, all the cases we look at would be stationary in that sense, but we will come at across a non-stationary process, we will see what happens in that case where you do not have explicit time dependence and yet you will have a non-stationary random process which will be the position for instance, we will see how it comes about. Okay. Now, to make it familiar with the diffusion equation, one possibility is to derive this diffusion equation independently altogether. We already looked at uh, diffusion on a linear lattice in the presence of a bias, we looked at a random walk and the question was can the random walk be made into an equation of this kind. Then of course, you begin to see immediately the connection between these two. So, we will do that now, but uh, one point thing I want to point out is that there is a special case of even this Fokker Planck equation and that is very, very important. It is a very basic process. In fact, it is the most basic Gaussian stationary Markov process It's just one of them it turns out and everything else can be mapped onto that and it is called the onstein ohlenbeck process. It corresponds to the case in which uh, you have the following extra simplification. So, the case in which A1 of x equal to A1 x and A2 of x equal to A2 a 1 to equal to constants. So, a case in which the drift is linear in x and the diffusion term is just a constant, this coefficient a 2 is a constant. This is called, this particular process then is called an onstein ohlenbeck process. So, let us write it down. A very important special case, and we'll spend some time solving this, uh, the density for the density function of this onstein ohlenbeck process, along with the physical <coughs> example. But in the meantime, let's go back and see whether we can 
derive this kind of equation from the random walk model altogether. So let us go back. to the uh, case of a biased <coughs> random walk on a linear lattice in one dimension. So if you go back and recall what the uh, statement of this problem was, we had a linear lattice, an infinite lattice say, labeled by the site index J some arbitrary site was the origin okay. and then you had a probability if you were at the site J of jumping to the right with the probability alpha and to the left with the probability beta and this was true at every site you would toss this unfair coin and you either jump to the right or to the left. Okay. Now we did that in the discrete time case but we also did it in the continuum. We said the time was continuous and the steps were given by a Poisson process with some mean rate lambda in which case the process that corresponded to right steps, steps to the right had a mean rate lambda alpha and those to the left had mean rate lambda beta. And if you recall the master equation in that case was dp j comma t, I suppress the fact that we started at the origin, we keep that going so that just a matter of uh, simplifying the notation, this was equal to lambda times alpha p of j minus 1 t plus beta times p of j plus 1 t minus alpha plus beta p of j comma t. Alpha plus beta is equal to 1 but I put that back here as alpha plus beta because I am going to recombine terms. Okay. So, do you recall this? This was the master equation for this probability p of j comma t. Okay, and the initial condition was p of j comma zero is delta of j comma zero, the Kronecker delta. We solved this, and we discovered the distribution was a modified Bessel function, i j of two lambda t square root of alpha beta, etc. Right now, we are not interested in that solution, but we want to see what happens in the continuum limit when this j becomes a continuous index. So, what we do is to introduce a lattice constant, this spacing A, I am going to let A go to 0 and correspondingly let the rate of jumps lambda become infinite because the distance you have to jump is going to go to 0 and the rate becomes infinite in a specific manner so as to derive a finite limit on for the right hand side, a proper limit for the right hand side. So the first step is to write this as equal to lambda times, let us choose this first, beta of p j plus 1 t minus p of j t minus let us subtract the other difference also p of j t minus p of j minus 1 t. So I have taken care of this term and this beta here in this portion here and then I added I subtracted that too, so I need to add that back. So this becomes plus lambda times beta minus alpha times p of j comma t minus p of j minus one comma t. So that's the other term. Did we go through this continuum approximation earlier? Have we explicitly done that? Okay, so so it's worth looking at it carefully to see what exactly is involved. So what I have done is to add and subtract this com thing here and I get this thing here. Now it is clear what you should do in order to get the continuum limit because this looks like the second difference. This looks like pj plus 1 minus twice pj minus pj uh, plus p plus pj minus 1. So this looks like the double difference, the second derivative and this looks like the first derivative if j were a continuous variable, right. So what we need to do is to multiply and divide by the lattice constant and take limits. So out here I need, I can rewrite this, this thing can be rewritten as p of j plus 1 t minus twice p 
of j t plus p of j plus 1 t. I divide the whole thing by a squared because it is a double difference here and multiply by a squared. I multiply this by a and divide this by a okay. and take the limit. So, the correct limit that we need to take the continuum limit is lambda tending to z infinity a tending to 0 and I want lambda a squared to become finite. That can only happen if beta minus alpha also tends to 0. So, that I get something which goes like an a squared here. So, we need a times alpha tends to beta such that and j tending to infinity because what I am going to do is to put j a tends to x. So, j also becomes infinite such that j times a is my x coordinate. Just like we went to the continuum limit in time by saying the time step n multiplied by the by tau the unit the unit time step was such that n tends to infinity tau goes to 0 such that n tau went to t the continuous variable. In exactly the same way j tends to infinity a tends to 0 such that j a goes to the variable x hmm? such that what we need here is lambda a squared beta limit lambda a squared beta is finite equal to some number d. Hmm. By the way, if alpha tends to beta, this is the same as the limit half lambda a squared equal to d because beta is also going to go to alpha and a times alpha minus beta times lambda tends to limit. equal to what would be the physical dimensions of this limit uh, of this quantity that is the length and that is the rate velocity just a velocity. So, let us call it alpha minus beta equal to c ok. Then, then this quantity p of j comma t tends to the probability density p of x comma t, but you got to pay attention to the fact that there is a dimensional change here because this is dimensionless a probability that is a density probability density it has dimensions 1 over a uh, 1 over length right. So, you have to be careful about it there is an extra a factor there which you can put in, but it is not so serious because it will appear on both sides out here and when you take that limit you end up with this equation becoming delta p over delta t of x comma t starting from some x naught we do not care we do not put it here equal to this quantity is d and now here here we have minus c delta p over delta x because that is the first derivative plus d And that is exactly in the form of this Fokker Planck equation that we have written down. So, in this problem, a1 of x equal to c, a2 of x equal to d, both of which are constants. A very trivial example in which these coefficients have actually become constants. So, the position in the case of bias diffusion, the position variable is a, see, looks like it is the Markov process, it obeys a Fokker Planck equation with constant coefficients. Both the drift and the diffusion terms are constant, it look, looks exactly like that, right. Agree? Okay. This kind of equation for the positional probability density when you have diffusion in the presence of an external field this fellow here looks like it is a drift caused by some external field 
because you are saying systematically either alpha is bigger than beta or smaller than beta, it drifts to one side whichever is larger and that is exactly what happens when you have a constant force on the particle. So, this looks like this equation is describing the diffusion of a position of a particle, positional probability density of a particle subject to diffusion, but under a constant external force of some kind and indeed it is so, it is indeed so, because if you recall uh, the problem of sedimentation that we talked about, this is exactly what happened, you had an extra term of exactly of this kind. We even saw the solution, we wrote the steady state solution I think in that case and what did we get in that case? Uh, the problem we looked at was I said uh, j equal to 0 here, 1 here, 2 here and we looked at a case where this part was bounded hmm? and then it turned out that p of j, p stationary of j was proportional to the bias alpha over beta. So, you have uh, a bias such that these rates are alpha and these rates are beta downwards and this was proportional to alpha over beta to the power j. This is what we had, we imposed a boundary condition on this, we said it cannot go below 0 out here. So, the rate alpha minus 1 to j equal to 0 was 0 and the rate from j to minus 1 the beta 0 was also equal to 0. Then we immediately got this as a steady state solution hmm? and we need to normalize this, we need to normalize this guy hmm? over j from 0 to infinity should be equal to 1 and that of course if you sum this geometric series is 1 <laughs> over 1 minus alpha over beta hmm? which is beta over alpha minus beta, correct. So, this whole thing is proportional to this guy, so equal to whatever is uh, normalization mm. times this. In this problem beta was greater than alpha, right. This is the steady state solution we got, mm. but we will now let us try and take the continuum limit of it here and see what you want to get. So, I need to put all these guys in. I need to put in all these fellows here back again. So, let us do that. Uh, alpha is going to go to beta, but I can write this fellow here. In this problem, beta is bigger than alpha in this case. So, we got to be a little careful here about the sign. I define my drift velocity c as alpha minus beta. So, if c is positive, it says alpha is bigger than beta, otherwise, c is going to be negative. We have to remember that sign here. So, let us write this as e to the power j log alpha or beta or log beta over alpha with a minus sign. And I am going to take the limit in which alpha is equal to beta. So, this becomes the limit that guy becomes 1, the log of 1 is going to get. So, what should I write? I write this as log beta minus alpha over alpha plus alpha over alpha, you can write it like that surely, hmm? which is 1 plus beta minus alpha over alpha. I mean we can do this very rigorously, but you can see what is happening. And this is going to go to 0, beta minus alpha. What is log 1 plus z as z goes to 0, the leading term? z itself right. So, this is can be replaced as beta minus alpha by alpha in this form. Hmm. Apart from some normalization, we will worry about that later and I want to make this j into x. So, I multiply by an a divide by an a. But a times beta minus alpha is going to c, right. So, let us multiply this by another a. This is what I had, and I multiply this by another a, so I got to put another a here. And let us put a lambda here and a lambda here.
we all set to take this limit because what does this whole thing go to? This fellow goes to x, that guy goes to c, hmm, minus c and this fellow goes to d. Hmm. Where did the x come from? Alpha, this was an alpha which is the same as beta in the limit. Right? So you are going to get something like e to the power minus e to the power cx over d where c is negative. I probably use the symbol C for the downward velocity, limiting velocity, but I have defined this C as an upward positive in the upward direction, so in the increasing J, so that is why I changed the sign here to this. Okay. But this is exactly what we got earlier, we interpreted this as the Peclé number and so on, but that is exactly what this gives you, this equation gives you, because if you go back to this equation and ask what is the stationary solution, what is it going to be? P stationary satisfies the equation d, d to p over dx2 stationary minus c dp stationary over dx equal to 0. That is what this tells you. But I can pull out a d, uh, d over dx from here and write this as d over dx, dp stationary over dx minus c times p or c, c over d. So, equal to 0. And c, by the way, is minus, uh, or is this is plus modulus c. That is the equation satisfied. And what is the solution? What is the solution to this equation? Not quite, not quite, because what you can what you can say from this is that this quantity is independent of x. So this guy must be equal to some constant. independent of x. Whereas here we did not have any such problem, we did the random walk problem and we immediately got the answer right away. But here we are getting an equation which says this fellow is actually independent of x, nothing more than that. Hmm? What would you have to do to match that to this and make sure that that constant is 0? You would have to put a boundary condition somewhere, we already put a boundary condition on the floor. We said it cannot go below the floor. We already did that here in this case. We have not yet imposed that condition there. We need to impose that condition which will be precisely that this quantity is 0 at x equal to 0 because this is the flux. Remember that this equation can be written in the form of an equation of continuity because I can write this as equal to minus delta j over delta x where j of x equal to d times dp over dx in this case plus mod c p. So it is in the form of a continuity equation in this case and that is the flux at any point <coughs> because it is precisely a continuity equation for this probability density. And then it says you cannot go through the floor. So it means this quantity, this current here must vanish at x equal to 0. But in the stationary case and only in the stationary case, this quantity is independent of x completely and since it vanishes at x equal to 0, it must vanish for all x. 
because it is independent of x. Okay. So, I emphasize again this quantity is not 0 for x not equal to 0 in general. There is a current otherwise you would have you would not have any dynamics at all certainly. P of x comma t in general is a function of t. Okay. But when you go to the stationary distribution there is no t dependence anymore. Okay. So, the statement is that the boundary condition says that the current as a function of t vanishes at x equal to 0 okay. for all t. What a partial differential equation I have to give you an initial condition and I have to give you a boundary condition. The boundary condition must be valid for all t. The initial condition is valid for all x for a given t right at t equal to 0. So, in this case this acts as a boundary condition and it says this quantity here vanishes at x equal to 0. And that same boundary condition applies even in the stationary distribution. But in the stationary distribution you discover that this quantity must be independent of x and since it is 0 at x equal to 0 it is 0 everywhere okay, identically. And once you put that in this is the solution. So, you see our discrete model went exactly into that that is so just a verification that these limits are all right that all these factors were right just right and it gives you this uh, equation here. In the special case in which you have this particle diffusing under a constant force field here you can apply to other cases it could be an electric field causing a steady drift or whatever but this is the exact continuum limit. So, the lesson is that the bias random walk with a constant bias the same bias at all sites is equivalent to the diffusion of a particle under a constant force field in the continuum limit. Okay. But now we are approaching the whole thing from the continuous Markov process angle. Okay. So, we are going to write down although we did not have any differential equation for the position of the particle in the random walk problem but only difference equations for the probability density. Now that we have a continuous Markov process we could go back and ask one more thing which is to ask okay it is a random variable but does the variable itself satisfy a differential equation or not. Hmm? This is not a differential equation for the variable it is a differential equation for the probability density of this variable and that is a nice object. Hmm? But the variable itself will be very irregular will be random because it is being driven by some fluctuations in this case. So, we are going to find out that this will satisfy a differential equation, but it is what is called a stochastic differential equation, a random differential equation. And it should correspond and be consistent with the fact that the probability density satisfies this master equation here. The general uh, name for a particle which is uh, for the positional probability density of a particle under diffusing under an external force field it is called a Smolikovsky equation. So, this is an example of the Smolikovsky equation. I will call it a Smolikovsky equation because it is uh, much more general than this. You already saw that this has the effect of a uh, constant force field. What would you say happens uh, would happen if there was a force here explicit force which was position dependent. How do you think this uh, equation would change? It would not be a constant this a 1 of x would not be a constant right. A 1 of x in some sense would be the force would involve the force. So, if the force were due to a potential V of x I would expect that something like minus V prime of x appears in this drift term okay. and then the diffusion the scattering would come from the D part here. So, this is something to keep in mind that the first term will be a drift due to deterministic forces and the second term would be the diffusion due to random forces okay. We will we'll systematize that. So, let us go back to this uh, Fokker Planck equation and ask is there a correspondence between an equation of the form delta p over delta t I will continue to use the variable x 
which does not have necessarily the connotation of a position, but a random continuous random variable <laughs> Markov process. So, delta p over delta t equal to minus delta over delta x a 1 of x t plus 1 half this is the Fokker Planck equation. Okay. It turns out that this Fokker Planck equation is entirely equivalent to a certain stochastic differential equation for this variable x, random variable x, which is now called a diffusion process in the mathematical sense. And that equation is the following. I will write it down, but I am not going to prove this. That this is entirely equivalent to a certain differential equation for x itself which reads in uh, sort of physics notation it is not the most rigorous notation it <coughs> reads uh, x dot equal to some function of x perhaps even a function of t if this is a function of t but we are looking at stationary processes so let us just call it f of x times <coughs> plus g of x. Uh, times a white noise and let me call it by eta t and explain what this eta is. And this is a stochastic differential equation where f and g are prescribed functions and they are related to a 1 and a 2 as I will write it down in an instant. But this eta of t is called a Gaussian white noise, a stationary Gaussian white noise and I will explain what that is separately. Where f of x is essentially a 1 of x and g of x, g squared of x is a 2. and eta of t is a stationary Gaussian white noise I have to say what this means okay eta of t is a, a random process in time such that all its probability distributions, multiple time probability distributions are all Gaussian in shape. So that is why it is called a Gaussian noise. It is stationary. So all its uh, statistical, its statistical average and higher moments are all time independent. Hmm? Correlation functions are functions only of the time difference, etc. And it is a noi white noise. In other words, it is delta correlated in the following sense. equal to 0, 0 mean and it is got a delta correlation, uh, delta correlated uh, delta function as an autocorrelation. It is clearly the limit, the mathematical limit of some physical noise whose correlation time would not be 0 because this implies the correlation time is 0. Whereas I would expect for a stationary process if t is bigger than t prime I would ex expect this uh, correlation to look like this as a function of mod t minus t prime I would expect this correlation to come down in this fashion. And this characteristic time scale would be the uh, correlation time of this noise. But that is now going to 0 and the amplitude is going to infinity such that in the limit it becomes a delta function. So, it is a mathematical idealization clearly. It would have to be justified on physical grounds each time. Okay. For instance, in the problem of, problem of uh, um, the collisions of uh, uh, in a gas of particles in a fluid for instance, this noise would be caused by all the other molecules colliding against some particular tag particle molecule. Then this eta of t would be the correlation time of that force the random force caused by the collisions all these other guys and the 
scale on which the particles motion itself is tracked, the time scale would be much longer, it would remember its memory for much longer than what the noise does. So the correlation time of the noise typically would be of the order of a nanosecond or a picosecond for instance, whereas the correlation time of the velocity of the particle that is being tracked that could be of the order of microseconds. So as far as a microsecond is concerned, a nanosecond or smaller intervals are essentially 0 intervals. So in that sense, one can justify this approximation. Okay. But each time in any problem when you model this, you have to ask whether there is a clear separation of time scales of this kind or not. Okay. But at the moment, from a mathematical point of view, the formal point of view, this is what uh, this equivalence is. So the statement is that a stochastic differential equation of this kind is entirely equivalent to this Fokker Planck equation for the probability density of this random variable. So please take this as a theorem, I am not proving, going to prove it here, but take this as a theorem, we are going to exploit it over and over again. Hmm. Now you can see why I call this a drift term, because if you did not have this noise at all, this is deterministic evolution of this variable under some prescribed function f of x here. It may be minus dv over dx, we do not care what it is or anything else. So this term is indeed describing deterministic dynamics and this is the noise is entirely here in this thing here and that is showing up in this second term here. Okay. What is interesting in this problem as opposed to even simpler problems is that this g has x dependence in general. So it says given a current value of x of this random variable, the way the noise affects it, the amplitude of that noise depends on this random variable on this x. On the other hand, and that is why it shows up here inside here. But in the example we looked at in the diffusion problem as a diffusion equation, remember this A2 turned out to be a constant. So in that case, this would have been square root of 2D and that is it. So now we, we can kind of identify what would be the stochastic equation corresponding to delta P over delta T equal to D, D2 P over delta X2 this would be equivalent to a stochastic differential equation hmm, for x which would be of the form x dot equal to, in this case there is no A1, so clearly there is no external force or anything of that kind, no drift at all, A1 is 0 identically and A2, well this D, half D is A2, so A2 is square root of, uh, is 2D and therefore G is square root of 2D. And that is it. Hmm? This is the stochastic differential equation corresponding to uh, for the position corresponding to the simple diffusion equation in one dimension. Okay. One can write a formal solution for this guy hmm? and that formal solution would be x of t, you have to define these integrals, minus x of 0 equal to square root of 2d times integral 0 to t, dt prime, eta of t prime. Agree? We can call this x of t naught if you like and integrate from t naught to t. So in that sense, a plane diffusing particle doing free diffusion, the x variable corresponds to the integral of white noise. This guy corresponds to the integral of white noise huh? and it is called a Wiener process. Is it a stationary random process? It is Markov because we wrote the master equation down, I said satisfies the Fokker-Planck equation and so on, so it is clearly a Markov process. But is it a stationary 
Markov. By the way, it is Gaussian that is something else you have to recognize because we know by hindsight we know the solution of this guy although we did not derive it here explicitly. We know the fundamental solution of this is that Gaussian e to the minus x squared over 4 dt which I will come back to talk about. So, what it is telling us is you are going to hit the particle with a Gaussian white noise that means the distribution of this eta is Gaussian and it is delta correlated stationary it is and Markov. Hmm. Then what is the output variable the driven variable x after this integration what properties does it have? Well, it remains Gaussian because its probability density is Gaussian. So, the shape remains Gaussian that is robust. What else happens? It is Markov, it is certainly Markov, it is obeys this Fokker Planck equation, but is it stationary? Will the stationarity remain? Does this look like if I if I had uh, x of t naught here and this is t naught to t, does this guy look like a function of t minus t naught in general? No. No, certainly not. Hmm. It is not stationary hmm. and you already know this because given this diffusion equation what does it imply for this quantity x of t minus x of 0 whole squared. What does this become? It is the mean square displacement hmm, from some given origin and what is that equal to? It is diffusing and therefore, what is it equal to? 2 dt exactly, exactly it is 2 dt, hmm? it is a function of t, it is a function of t. So, it cannot be stationary <coughs> because if it is a stationary random process all these moments should be independent of t, but here right away it tells you it is not stationary immediately. We have not computed what the correlation function of x is, we have not found what is x of t prime x of t double x of t x of t prime average, we have not found that yet, but certainly we have found what is x of t x squared of t average and that is 2 dt that is just a Gaussian integral. So, it is not stationary, it is not stationary. It has stationary increments because you can write this guy obviously as dx equal to square root of 2 d eta of t dt. You can write it like that and then of course, this is stationary. This has stationary increments, but it is not a stationary random process by itself or more uh, less rigorously it is derivative is stationary, but this function is not and the variable itself is not. And that you can see directly when you take something which has got stationarity, but you integrate it in this fashion. Integration makes it non-local in some sense, so it's it's not stationary. So in general, that's a lesson. That when you integrate white noise, you may not retain the stationarity property, but we're going to see that if you put a proper drift, you will be able to do this. That's what the velocity would do, and then it would attain an equilibrium distribution and so on. There is another way of saying that this guy is not stationary because its probability density p of x comma t given an x naught this fellow is decreasing as a function of time and it does not tend to any stationary distribution as t tends to infinity it goes to 0. This Gaussian broadens out over an infinite range the total area under the curve remains 1, but the value at any point is tending to 0. So, there is no stationary distribution in this problem the variable is not a stationary random variable either. Hmm? Okay. So, we will get back to all these things, but at the moment I want you to uh, simply pay uh, remember the fact that the most general definition of uh, diffusion process could be either this or this does not matter either way. Hmm. Now, mathematicians do not like to work with these delta correlated noises, they would rather work with the, the differential. The, so, the, uh, something which smooths it out by integrating. So, a Wiener process can be handled more rigorously than this uh, singular object here. So, you integrate it once to make it smooth and so on, but we are going to not going to pay attention to these niceties. We will be careful not to make uh, any mistakes, but at the same time we will do this rather heuristically here provided we know there are certain, uh, certain uh, rules which we have to obey and one of them is this that there is this equivalence between the Fokker-Planck equation on the one hand and this on the other. 
and we will see what happens with this. Now already you can begin to see whether there is going to be a stationary distribution or not by saying if so this thing must have a solution when you make this an ordinary differential with respect to x and if this guy has a solution which is normalizable and so on then you know there is a stationary distribution okay. And if you do not have this, if you do not have this and A is constant then the stationary distribution is triviality itself in this case if at all there is a p stationary it must satisfy d2 p stationary over dx2 equal to 0. But what does that say about p stationary? Must be a linear function that is certainly not normalizable right away you are gone it is finished huh? in an infinite range in an infinite range or even in a semi infinite range it is still not normalizable. What would happen if you had a finite range? Yes, then indeed it can be. So then you have you do not require integration up to infinity. Then yes, indeed it can it can it is true. Suppose you are told that P stationary is between these two points, nothing more than that. I put a diffusing particle here, it is like putting a drop of ink inside a beaker of water, the ink does not go anywhere, but it becomes uniform everywhere intuitively we know this by diffusion. So that is what will happen this particles probability density will be uniform will be constant in this boundary provided there is no escape from the ends there is no leakage from the ends. So in that case yes indeed because I then I would say P stationary equal to AX plus B and I would put boundary conditions at the ends and you discover finally that A is 0 and you have just B which is normalized okay. So the boundary conditions also play a crucial role in the whole thing. We will talk about these aspects in the next, uh, next time. We will start with the Fokker-Planck equation and see where we can go.